Good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon or this morning or this, this uh, uh, evening, depending on the time zone you're in, we will focus on a new book by historian Julia Rose Kraut, Threat of Dissent, the history of ideological exclusion and deportation in the United States. I'm Christian Osterman, and I have the privilege and pleasure to co-chair uh, this seminar with Eric Arneson of George Washington University, who directs the National History Center. As those of you who know, um, who tune in um, regularly know, we are experimenting with different formats. Today, Eric will be in a conversation with Julia for the first half of the seminar before opening it up to questions and uh, debate um, with all of you. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the National History Center of the American Historical Association. We're currently in our 10th year of holding these sessions. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who helped produce this event. Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. Our thanks go to both of them. We also like to thank our uh, two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest at Villanova University and the George Washington University's History Department. Both of them support um, the sessions, the sessions financially. We also like to thank a number of individual donors who make these meetings uh, possible and whose rank we invite you to join. Details about how to do so are available, will be available in the chat room uh, momentarily. Please join the ranks of our donors. Today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations' websites. Um, so you can uh, relive the experience. For the Q&A part of this webinar, we um, ask you to please use the raise hand function in the Zoom room if you would like to ask a question. Once you press the button, you will be entered into a queue and um, Eric will call on you. Once he does so, you will re receive a prompt that will ask you to unmute your screen. Please, please press yes, and then you're able, you should be able to talk. You may also submit questions to Rachel Wheatley via email provided in the chat function. With that, I think uh, I have the pleasure of turning the Zoom room over to my co-chair, Eric Arneson. Eric. Thank you, Christian. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Julia Rose Kraut, who is both a lawyer and an historian. She received her BA from Columbia University and her PhD from New York University. Her law degree is from the American University's Washington College of Law. She's the inaugural Judith S. K. Fellow for the Historical Society of New York Courts. Uh, and today we will be talking about her new book, uh, Threat of Dissent, uh, A History of Ideological Exclusion and Deportation in the United States, published this past July by Harvard University Press. Julia will begin by telling us something about the book and then we will begin a conversation. Julia, the screen is yours. Great. Well, I'm delighted to join you. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to talk a little bit about Threat of Dissent. And uh, I think what I'll do is uh, start with talking a little bit about my arguments as well as some highlights in the book. Uh, so Threat of Dissent is a legal, political, and social history of the expulsion and barring of foreign non-citizens from the United States based on their political beliefs, associations, and expressions. And it is a chronological narrative, which I begin in uh, 1798 with the Alien Friends Act and take all the way through 
uh, to the war on terror and the Trump administration. And so uh, I trace the history of this very unique intersection of immigration and First Amendment law and history. Uh, what I find is that these ideological exclusion and deportation laws are passed and revised during moments uh, of national insecurity, like the brink of war, during wartime, economic depression, um, national uh, upheaval um, or international upheaval, and um, in response to a violent act or occurrence. Uh, they are uh, past or revised during moments of national insecurity in the name of national security. And what I argue in the book is that the use of ideological exclusion and deportation is continuous, and it's used as a tool of political repression to suppress the threat of dissent. And the threat of dissent includes criticism of US policies and politicians, uh, advocacy of reform or revolution, or challenges to the status quo or capitalism. And um, what I found is, is that this tool is enduring. And the reason why it endures to this day is because the majority of the Supreme Court has interpreted ideological exclusion and deportation as an immigration issue as opposed to um, a First Amendment issue, thus applying immigration legal doctrine, which insulates uh, these restrictions from substantive judicial review, strict scrutiny, and more speech protective uh, standards under the First Amendment. And so um, some highlights of the book include um, a very uh, rich history that provides a fresh perspective on immigration and uh, the First Amendment and civil liberties uh, law and history. And um, each chapter includes those who pass the laws, those who enforce the laws, those who challenge the laws, and those excluded or deported under them. And there are so many, a lot of familiar names, including Emma Goldman, Clarence Darrow, John Lennon, Carlos Fuentes, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, J. Edgar Hoover, Francis Perkins, uh, and Graham Greene and Charlie Chaplin. And so the list goes on, but all of these characters are in the book and part of this story. Um, what I also do is I, talk a little bit about um, the use of power and discretion uh, by public officials, those who chose to use their power and authority to exclude or deport more, and those who chose to exclude or deport less, those who um, use their power to admit, exclude, and deport, or to defer or delay uh, deportations. And so, this discussion of discretion and power under the law uh, runs throughout the entire book. Um, what I also uh, describe is uh, the linkage between deportation and denaturalization. Uh, I had not anticipated focusing on denaturalization, but what I discovered through research was that there was the efforts to deport and denaturalize go hand in hand, stripping citizenship from foreign, uh, not, not um, foreign non-citizens, um, but who became citizens when in the United States uh, to remove those protections of citizenship was crucial in order to eject them. And so these efforts and drives to deport um, also included the drive to denaturalize as well. Uh, what I also found is that by taking this long view this long narrative, I was able to uh, track the continuities and consistencies over time, the continuities of the use of law and the law the, itself, as well as the consistencies of arguments for ideological exclusion, deportation, and especially those challenges 
to ideological exclusion, deportation. And those challenges, um, which are still articulated today, uh, include uh, the argument that ideological restrictions are a form of censorship, that uh, they uh, interfere with First Amendment protections, they interfere with free exchange, academic freedom, free inquiry. Uh, they also damage the reputation of the United States as a nation of immigrants and as a free, confident nation, depicting it rather as a fearful, um, insecure nation. And that uh, this is passed in the name of national security while undermining values of free expression and values, American values in liberal democracy. And so that is uh, some of the, per the this fresh perspective that Threat of Dissent provides and hopefully will make a contribution to not only immigration law and history, but also First Amendment and civil liberties law and history. All right. Thank you, Julia, for getting us started. You've only been able to scratch the surface in your brief remarks because uh, uh, there's so, so much more in the book. And you've talked about sort of the larger themes, uh, which we can go into, but the book also is uh, full of very dramatic case studies uh, of some of the individuals and many others that, that you talked about uh, that makes for uh, very uh, engaging reading. So let me start with one of the, the larger themes or kind of a backdrop, a key concept in the book um, that, which is that of, of, of the plenary power doctrine yes. uh, and the court's persistent deference to the executive branch in the realm of immigration matters. Uh, assuming that there are many folks watching this session who are not attorneys or are legal historians, could you talk a bit about the concept uh, of, uh, of plenary power doctrine uh, and the role that it plays in your story? Yes, sure. Well, I just mentioned that one of the problems that I found um, is that uh, the majority of the Supreme Court interprets ideological exclusion and deportation as a immigration issue and then applies immigration legal doctrine as opposed to First Amendment doctrine um, and uh, precedent and strict scrutiny and the, those sp speech protective legal standards. Now the immigration legal doctrine I was talking about is the plenary power doctrine. And um, this is a doctrine in immigration law that holds that Congress has the power and the authority to pass laws to exclude and deport. And that authority is derived um, under the nation's sovereignty and its inherent right to self-preservation. Now, the executive is charged with enforcing those laws and the judiciary should defer to Congress as well as to the executive and their decisions upon uh, who, whom to deport or exclude. And so under this doctrine, there's extreme judicial deference to the executive and uh, to the legislative branches when it comes to immigration issues. And we still see this today. And so um, what I found is that although people argued that ideological restrictions were a form of censorship and violated the First Amendment and that First Amendment uh, law should apply, that because of this interpretation, of these restrictions as immigration law, the plenary power apply and thus insulated these restrictions from substantive judicial review. And this is something that uh, the plenary power doctrine was established uh, in the late 19th century by uh, the Supreme Court um, in cases upholding Chinese exclusion and has continued its hold uh, in immigration law, and you can find it throughout uh, immigration uh, legal precedent and Supreme Court uh, decisions that pertain to uh, immigration restriction. Thank you. One of the questions that I had um, in reading the book, or I was grappling with and engaging the various case studies, centers on the matter of efficacy. 
Uh, so at various times, the federal government sought to restrict or to block entry into the country of persons that it deemed to be hostile uh, to national security or who were seen to be as sources of subversion. And then it sought to deport various people who were seen in the same way. But the position staked out uh, by many of those targeted by the government, uh, those positions were held in many instances by many American citizens. So with regard to communism, for instance, yes, many immigrants or potential visitors to the United States were communists. Uh, and so, you know, keeping them out might you know, protect the nation, but, but the United States also was home to tens of thousands of American-born uh, uh, communists uh, as well, who loudly trumpeted uh, their beliefs at home. So I guess my question is, to what extent was the government effective um, in its alleged protection of Americans from these subversive ideas? And if it wasn't effective, why wasn't that lesson learned? Okay. Um, so that's a great question. And what you find with ideological exclusion deportation is that it reflects um, this fear of subversion in the United States and uh, the view of foreigners as the source of subversion. Uh, exclusion, trying to protect the United States from the threat from without, from the threat from abroad um, of subversion. And then deportation as trying to uh, prevent subversion from within. And what you also find is that this is a tool. It's a tool often used in conjunction with uh, the suppression of dissent and the threat of dissent uh, targeting Americans and targeting those within the United States. They go hand in hand. Um, and so what I do is I trace that through, uh, looking at initially with uh, the Alien Friends Act and it's, uh, the passage with the Sedition Act in 1798, but also looking at the war on anarchy uh, in the early 20th century, and that in addition to the suppression of newspapers and meetings and passage of the criminal anarchy law in New York, um, which targeted anarchists, uh, American and foreign non-citizens, but also there was the passage of the Alien Immigration Act of 1903 that barred anarchists from our shores and authorized their deportation. So we see this also during World War I and during uh, the McCarthy era in the 1950s. And so these are tools and they also exploit the vulnerability of foreign non-citizens and foreign uh, immigrant citizens who naturalized to denaturalization deportation or those uh, who sought entry, uh, temporary or as immigrants, to exclusion. And so this becomes another kind of tool in the, to in the toolbox of suppression. But the targeting also reflects this fear of subversion and the conflation of subversion and foreigners at the same time. Were they successful? This is not a story about numbers. And so what I, what I conclude in the book is that you don't have a ton of people who are in fact excluded or deported. It's really a story about fear and the threat of exclusion and deportation and what this means. And so there are a lot of people who might give up on the process, might choose not to come to the United States to attend that meeting, to take that um, uh, position at a university. Uh, because of uh, fear of investigation or delays in uh, obtaining a visa um, or not wanting to enter on a conditional visa. There are those who never left the United States, but under the threat of denaturalization or deportation, um, curtailed their own speech, uh, self-censored, um, or those who um, felt persecuted. Uh, under these laws. And so what you find is that um, those who face suppression, Americans and non-citizens um, in the United States uh, felt that suppression in a, similar ways, but, it, but also in different ways because of these ideological exclusion deportation laws. Um, what is also remarkable is the endurance of them in, 
all the way to today, which is over the course of um, the mid 19th, excuse me, mid 20th century, uh, particularly in, in the late 1950s and 1960s, we have more speech protective legal standards of the First Amendment. There are attempts to, uh, by the Supreme Court to roll back a lot of those loyalty oaths and suppression under um, anti-communism. However, the statutes that provide for ideological exclusion, deportation remain. They survive that rollback and they survive immigration reform in uh, the mid 1960s. And they're used well into the 1980s, those provisions. And so that's part of the danger here, which is how long these um, laws are on the books and how they can be used subsequently um, and refashioned and revised and revived um, to continue to pose a threat to First Amendment uh, rights and free speech and exchange and association um, through to today. Your, your point about ideological um, uh, exclusion and deportation going hand in hand um, with domestic repression, I, I think is the one that, that uh, uh, comes across in a number of the case studies. And I think it's a, a very uh, important point. Uh, and in reading this, uh, I saw the book or, or viewed the book in some ways and, you know, as a parallel on a parallel track to say Jeffrey Stone's uh, earlier work, you know, Perilous Times, a book about uh, free speech in wartime, you know, which centers much more on, on the domestic side, uh, whereas you take a broader you know, international canvas. So uh, the two things going hand in hand together, I think, is, is a very uh, uh, apt uh, point. Um, there are a number of fascinating case stories in the book, and I want to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, some of them. And maybe you could start out with the study of Harry Bridges, the Australian-born left-winger who was a labor activist, who uh, was head of the radical International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union on the West Coast. He was uh, regularly uh, targeted uh, by government officials uh, for uh, deportation. Could you say something about his story? Okay, so his story appears in, in the book uh, in chapter four. And um, what I cover in chapter four is this look uh, at restrictions, particularly the efforts to um, deport and to uh, denaturalize uh, in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And this is a very interesting uh, time because what you have and what I describe in the book is um, two strong women um, who um, are part of this story and very important to the story. Um, you have the first uh, woman in the cabinet, Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, and um, at the time, um, the Immigration Natural and Naturalization Service fell under um, the Labor Department. You also have Carol Weiss King. Um, who becomes legal counsel uh, for a new organization called the American Committee for Protection of Foreign Born. And they uh, represent a lot of uh, those who are facing deportation, including ideological uh, deportation. And Carol Weiss King um, is the lawyer uh, who becomes the preeminent immigration lawyer in the country, and she represents Harry Bridges. And so Harry Bridges in this story might be familiar to some. Again, he is that uh, Australian-born uh, labor leader in the United States, um, head of the West Coast, a CIO, and J. Edgar Hoover is determined to get him out of the uh, United States. And he also has, uh, Bridges also has some rivals uh, within la the labor organization. And one way that they're gonna try to get him out of the United States uh, after uh, Hoover uh, provides a uh, very lengthy dossier uh, on his um, affiliations and background on Bridges is to use ideological deportation. 
and to claim that um, he is uh, a member of a subversive organization. And so they're gonna deport him under one of the ideological uh, exclusion deportation laws. Uh, now where Frances Perkins comes in is that um, she comes under fire by using her discretion. As I said earlier in my remarks, part of the story is the use of discretion, decisions to uh, deport or exclude more or less or to defer or delay deportations. And that's what happens with Frances Perkins um, defers and delays uh, these efforts to deport uh, Harry Bridges. Um, and she comes under fire from Congress for this decision. And uh, a congressman from Texas named Martin Dyes, who is a head of the House of Un-American Activities uh, Committee, uh, and attempts with his colleagues to uh, impeach her for her decision in 1939 to delay um, and defer deportation of Harry Bridges under um, these ideological exclusion um, and deportation laws. And part of the, what I explore is that um, there is a question of interpretation of the law and whether it pertains uh, to uh, present membership or past membership or affiliation. And that becomes very important. There's another case I mentioned in which um, Perkins says, you know, I'm waiting for the outcome of this Supreme Court decision, which is Kessler v. Strecker. Uh, and uh, in that case, also a deportation case, the Supreme Court dismisses the deportation efforts because um, the fellow uh, in that case is uh, no longer a member of the uh, communist par or communist party um, or subversive organization. And so the Supreme Court um, holds that the interpretation of the statute is that only present members need, um, uh, can be deported under the law. That pertains to Bridges. At that point, um, uh, Francis Perkins then says, okay, we'll hold a hearing uh, in light of this decision and after this hearing, uh, the determination is that uh, Bridges might be sympathetic to um, those who are members of the Communist Party, but he is not currently a member of the Communist Party. Now what happens? What happens is Congress is all up in arms and J. Edgar Hoover is just ballistic and uh, Dyes is really upset as well and they changed the law. <laughs> Congress passes the Alien Registration Act of 1940, also known as the Smith Act, and that changes the law to provide for deportation for past membership. And it really is targeting Harry Bridges. And so there's another hearing and another case and a Supreme Court decision in Bridges and Wick, um, v. Wixon. Um, the Supreme Court says he was never a member of the Communist Party or affiliated with the Communist Party. And so um, the attempt to deport Harry Bridges is dashed once again, but the, the uh, government is determined to uh, try to um, get Harry Bridges out of the country. And although uh, Bridges becomes a citizen after he wins, after this victory for Carol Weiss King and Bridges uh, in the 1940s, uh, the government tries to um, denaturalize him and uh, attempts to deport him once again, and th those fail. Uh, so it takes a lot out of uh, Harry Bridges. It's a long story, uh, but a very important one in terms of uh, the history of ideological exclusion in the United S and deportation in the United States. Let's move forward in time, and I can't resist asking you about the case of Ernest Mandel, uh, a Trotskyist scholar and activist who found himself barred from the United States in the 1960s, even though he had been here before and had, had, had lectured here uh, uh, in, in the past. And my interest in the Mandel case is sparked in part by my having taken a class with him uh, and another Marxist academic, Andre Gunder Frank, uh, in a summer session at Boston University in 1979, uh, right before my senior year in college. Um, and at the time, um, I had 
no idea of the government's uh, efforts uh, to keep him out of the country. And frankly, I knew nothing of its efforts until I read your book. Oh. There's, a lot, there's, a, there's a lot going on in the 1960s. Uh, right. And I can't imagine Mandel's readership being all that great. I mean, his books could be very long and very dense and Marxist prose. Um, and yet, the government expended not insignificant effort to keep this guy out. Um, so what did it do and why? Okay, uh, well, thank you for sharing that. And I can talk a little bit after I discuss the, the Mandel case about why he would have gone into the country in 1979 um, to uh, teach that class. Um, so this is a fascinating case and very important. This precedent is still um, what we apply to uh, exclusion cases today. Um, and I devote an entire chapter to um, not only the Ernest Mandel case, but exclusions and attempts to deport um, during the Nixon administration. And um, this is also an example of the importance of archival research. So I'm able to provide for the first time the backstory uh, on Ernest Mendel's exclusion um, and also a view of what um, the, the Supreme Court was wrestling with and uh, what led to its decision uh, to uphold the Ernest uh, Mendel's exclusion. And so what you find is, is that Ernest Mendel is a Belgian Marxist economist, um, also a journalist, and he has come to the United States on prior occasions in 1962 and 1968, and then is invited to debate John Kenneth Galbraith um, in a uh, conference, at a conference at Stanford University. And he's also invited to come to various uh, university and college campuses also to give talks. This is early um, in the uh, fall of 1969. And uh, he applies for his visa to come and he's denied. And he had just come the year before and he can't understand this. And so through archival research, I tracked the correspondence um, between Mandel and uh, consular officials in the State Department. And he discovers that he was uh, deemed inadmissible and excludable under the McCarran-Walter Act of 1952 because he is a, a teacher advocate and has published the doctrines of world communism. And that um, provides for the exclusion deportation under this McCarran-Walter Act passed at the height of McCarthyism, but now has survived uh, to be used by the Nixon administration in 1969. So he doesn't understand how is it possible that he could have entered the year before, but not now. And what he discovers is that um, he had been granted entry under a waiver provision, which allows uh, entry to those who are deemed inadmissible uh, with the recommendation of the Secretary of State and approval by the Attorney General. And so he did not know that he had entered under a waiver, but apparently he had. Now, usually when you enter under a waiver, you are on a conditional, uh, under a conditional visa, which restricts what you can do within the United States and how long you can stay. And so what the State Department claims is that because he attended a cocktail party that was not part of his itinerary, uh, he strayed from uh, the conditions of his conditional visa under the waiver, which he claims he had no knowledge of, and now uh, will not be granted a waiver again. So what happens is that he says, I didn't know, if you let me in, I will stick to my itinerary. And now I know that I was deemed inadmissible and I think that's ridiculous, but I will follow the rules. And the Secretary um, of State and through the State Department says, sure, okay, we will now recommend you uh, to receive a waiver. But the ultimate decision is made by the Attorney General and Attorney General John N. Mitchell in the Nixon administration says no and refuses to grant the waiver. 
And so what I do is I tell a little bit of that story, the outrage by academics um, that, that call this censorship and say that this is a, an infringement of academic freedom and damages the reputation of the United States. All those arguments I talked about before um, articulated and the concern that by 1969, we should not be um, returning to the, the days of McCarthyism where you have exclusions under the McCarran-Walter Act. Um, under these provisions. And what are we still doing in 1969, uh, excluding a scholar like Ernest Mendel? And so what is intriguing, what makes this case so important is the challenge, the legal challenge to his exclusion. Now, what I explain in earlier chapters, so in, in during the war on anarchy, I mentioned before about um, the Alien Immigration Act of 1903, uh, which bars anarchists. That is actually the first um, ideological exclusion law in the United States. The Supreme Court in a case in 1904 upholds the exclusion of a British anarchist named John Turner. And, based, and what the Supreme Court says is those seeking entry to the United States have no constitutional rights, including under the First Amendment. And so they can't challenge uh, their exclusion under the First Amendment. So Ernest Mendel uh, has no rights, has no constitutional right to enter and no constitutional right under the First Amendment to challenge his exclusion. But what about those within the United States, including the professors who invited him to come and uh, give a talk at their university um, or college campuses? And so a, the most famous uh, First Amendment attorney in the United States at that time, Leonard Boudin, along with a young attorney named David Rosenberg, challenged Mendel's exclusion as a violation of the professor's First Amendment right to receive information to hear. So under the First Amendment, you have the right to speak as well as the right to hear and to receive information. And the precedent that um, establishes that right to receive information and right to hear happened in the, in the 1960s. So they're using recent precedent to make this argument and also to circumvent that John Turner case and the Supreme Court's decision. So um, they're gonna argue that uh, Mendel's exclusion violates those within the United States, their First Amendment rights. And um, the case goes up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, although upholds the uh, exclusion of Ernest Mendel, also upholds the right of these professors or those within the United States to challenge exclusion based on their, the violation of their constitutional rights under the First Amendment. And we still use that pathway today, using this precedent to challenge exclusion. Also, the Supreme Court, in decision by Justice Harry Blackman, issues a new test. Now, before, the Attorney General didn't have to give a reason for why he was denying the waiver. And what Justice Blackman says is, no, you have to give a facially legitimate and a bona fide reason for denying that waiver. Now, that's a low standard. That's lower than strict scrutiny or any um, First Amendment speech protective standard. But it's a standard nonetheless, and it does require a reason. And it's still the standard that we use today. Um, so this is a foundational case, very important um, precedent that is set with um, Ernest Mendel. And uh, so unfortunately, while Ernest Mendel is excluded, uh, we do have this new standard and this new pathway to challenge exclusion. What's also significant is that this is part of the Nixon administration's effort to suppress dissent, to um, suppress uh, dissent on college campuses and uh, protests, as well as um, part of using immigration law as a, a tool and part of his abuse of power. So at the same time, the Nixon administration excludes Shirley Graham Du Bois, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's widow from the United States, um, and attempts to deport John Lennon from the United States. And what's something I call, um, or I refer, I discuss in the book called uh, selective deportation, uh, targeting individuals for deportation 
based on um, their beliefs or associations or expressions, uh, which violates the First Amendment. Uh, and uh, that's, some, that's a, something that a lot of people don't know about the Nixon administration and his, uh, the attempt to deport John Lennon, um, but is part of that story and is part of this, uh, this narrative in terms of use of immigration law um, as a tool of political repression. Thank you. There are already some hands in the queue, but I just have a few more questions before we turn it over to those folks who are watching. Repression could be extensive, as you show, but as you also show, it had limits. Uh, and your discussion of the immigrant activist uh, anarchist, uh, Emma Goldman, is absolutely fascinating. She emerges in the headlines in 1892 following the shooting of Henry Clay Frick by her partner in the context of the Homestead strike. She returns to headlines in 1901 following President McKinley's assassination. And yet, despite harassment, surveillance, persecution, she remained a public figure, continuing to write and to lecture widely. And you quote her at one point saying, nothing helps a movement like suppression, uh, end quote. Uh, yet ultimately she was imprisoned and then deported during the Red Scare in late 1919, shipped off on the uh, SS Buford, the Soviet or the Red Ark, uh, shipped off to the new Soviet Union. Could you just talk briefly about Goldman and how she managed to escape some of the worst of the anti-anarchist crusade for years, and then what changed? Okay. Well, this is, um, Goldman is a, is a fascinating case. And um, what is so interesting about her story and why the long narrative is so important is that um, it takes a long time to get her out of the country and people and the government is determined to rid the United States of this notorious anarchist leader, Emma Goldman. Um, and Emma Goldman um, is an immigrant um, from Lithuania, which was part of the Russian empire um, and comes in the late 19th century. Uh, she's radicalized by the Haymarket um, affair and becomes the leader of the anarchist movement in the United States. Now, when I talk about the war on anarchy, uh, it is uh, the suppression of anarchists in the wake of the assassination of President McKinley in 1901 by a self-proclaimed anarchist named Leon Cholgosh, who was born in the United States, but he has a foreign sounding name. Again, we have a conflation between um, foreigners and dissenters and radicals, uh, this fear of subversion um, by those within the United States and those coming from the outside. Now he claims, uh, Chogosh does, that uh, Emma Goldman's speeches set him on fire and that uh, he uh, attended one of her lectures and this inspired him. But they can't link, the government cannot link Emma Goldman to the assassination of President McKinley. And Chogosh admits that he acted alone and that Goldman had no idea what he intended to do. Um, so this, despite her, um, they, she's arrested, uh, the authorities have to let her go. They cannot link her to the assassination. But there is a determination that she has to go, that the effort is going to be to deport her. And this takes a long time. Now I, I, just, now I talked a little bit about this, how deportation and denaturalization go hand in hand. And this becomes the problem in efforts to deport her because she is a citizen of the United States um, in that she uh, claims citizenship, derivative citizenship through her husband. Although estranged for many years, um, her husband who also claims derivative, derivative citizenship um, is uh, what, what prevents her from being deported. So she is a citizen and um, has a long residency within the United States. So I tell that story in chapter two about the efforts uh, to try to suppress Emma Goldman, but this problem with the fact that she is a, a citizen through her husband. So what happens by 1909, the United States successfully denaturalizes her. How? by denaturalizing her husband and um, breaking uh, this derivative citizenship. And so you can denaturalize by fraud, 
mis misrepresentation during the, the naturalization process or um, to prove lack of attachment to the principles of the Constitution. And so um, they attack uh, her husband's citizenship through uh, fraud or misrepresentation. And she's denaturalized by 1909. But she has a long residency within the United States. So what happens is, is that she is able to stay. They just have to find grounds to deport her. And under the exclusion deportation laws at the time, um, you can uh, there are limits to deportation. So under the law, it's three years uh, after entry that you can deport. And so um, the law changes to expand um, in 1917 to five years. And then there's a, a major change in the law in 1918 under the Anarchist Exclusion Act, which provides for deportation for um, anarchists at any time no matter how long they had been in the United States. And so J. Edgar Hoover, who was just getting his start, this young whippersnapper who has helped A. Mitchell Palmer uh, round up radicals and attempt to deport them uh, in the Palmer raids, his first effort is to try to deport Emma Goldman. And he knows he can because she was denaturalized in 1909. And she's eventually with her comrade, Alexander Berkman, deported on the Red Ark in uh, 1919 under the Alien Exclusion Act. Thank you. Let me pose one last question before we open it up. Uh, and let me fast forward to the very recent past and present. So the 21st century, as you show toward the end of the book, saw a serious revival or extensive use of the practices that you recount uh, in, in the book um, as the end of the Cold War is then followed by a new open-ended war on terror. Can you talk specifically about continuities and discontinuities, what remains the same and what changes? Okay. Well, a lot remains the same. And so let me go back to right after um, the Ernest Mandel decision. Because I, what I do is I talk in, in the book, in chapter seven and then in chapter eight, this uh, transition period from um, anti-communism and the Cold War to the war on terror. And the uh, shift from uh, communists being the object of fear uh, to terrorists and the use of uh, terrorist, anti-terrorist provisions to exclude or deport. You mentioned before that you took this class um, with Ernest Mandel in 1979, and that was possible because some of the laws were beginning to change mm -hmm. uh, in the 1970s. So by 1977, um, there is an amendment uh, to a federal statute that provides uh, more protections for those seeking entry to the United States and uh, more sh uh, a strict um, oversight uh, to the waiver process. And so it requires those who would be inadmissible under a particular provision in the McCarran-Walter Act, uh, section um, 212A28, uh, uh, which M Mendel had uh, fallen under, uh, that waivers could only be denied uh, if there was some kind of security threat that they, that they could demonstrate that this, this um, admission uh, would uh, pose a threat to national security. And so what that, what that means is that uh, Ernest Mandel would have been granted a conditional visa and a waiver um, under this, this change and would have been able to temporarily stay to teach that course in 1979. Uh, but that wasn't a big change. And what I explain in the book is that the provisions, the security provisions and ex uh, ideological exclusion hangs on through the McCarran-Walter Act through the 1980s. And what you see are their efforts uh, led by organizations like PEN America and the American Civil Liberties Union, as well as efforts in Congress uh, to, led by uh, Congressman Barney Frank to repeal those provisions and ideological exclusion. There had not been in an incentive to do so um, because nobody wanted to appear soft on communism. 
and uh, there was no incentive to, to, for those within Congress to uh, repeal those provisions. And we see a little bit of an opening in the 1980s as the Cold War is, become, is coming to a close. Now, Frank um, and these organizations are largely successful, but they also open the door at the same time to this threat of um, terrorism and provisions in the law that shifts from anti-communism to anti-terrorism. And we see the use of uh, anti-terrorism provisions and material support to uh, terrorist organizations and foreign uh, designated foreign terrorist organizations beginning in the late 1980s and through the 1990s. So when we think about the entry of the war to the war on terror after um, September 11th, we really do need to think about um, this shift and this concern about terrorism and anti-terrorism provisions in the 1990s that really set the stage for the war on terror. Now, in, under, um, additional existing provisions and new laws in the early 21st century during the war on terror, like the USA Patriot Act um, and other provisions uh, that provide for uh, material support to terrorist um, organizations. We have the guilt by association and interpretation of what constitutes membership, affiliation or support that we saw in the 1950s and 1960s in, in terms of communism shift to terrorism. And um, what I dis discuss in the book, uh, in the last chapter, in chapter eight, is this use of material support to ideologically exclude critics of US foreign policy um, and academics who are seeking entry to uh, attend conferences or take up academic appointments at American universities and also the dangers that uh, the expansive interpretation of uh, what constitutes a terrorist organization, terrorist activity or material support can do to association rights and free expression rights to American citizens as well as foreign non-citizens in the United States and those seeking entry to the United States. I, I then conclude with the Trump administration and extreme vetting. Now, uh, some might recall that during uh, the campaign uh, that President, uh, then uh, Republican nominee, uh, Donald Trump, uh, one of his campaign speeches was, there was a reference to the Cold War and this, this uh, call for extreme vetting. Uh, there's a reference which I include in the book where he says, well, we had, we had these ideological um, restrictions um, in, in the Cold War and we need extreme vetting. I remember, I remember watching that and going, oh my goodness, uh, let's see what happens. And lo and behold, during the Trump administration, we have seen um, efforts to uh, exclude um, and to deport and use extreme vetting. That's strikingly similar. Um, what has changed is technology. Uh, during the, uh, with, with social media, data collection um, and use of social media, there is a real concern uh, that uh, your uh, affiliations, uh, what you uh, like uh, on Twitter or uh, Facebook, the expression that you carry around in your pocket and, at, and um, on you at all times through your laptop, through these social media handles and accounts can be used against you, either during the visa process, um, which uh, requires you to disclose social um, media handles, uh, as well as uh, at the border. And so I provide examples of inspections of one's phone or laptop. And this affects American citizens too, but particularly those who are seeking entry to the United States. Um, and uh, the border, uh, border control and um, uh, officials from the Department of Homeland Security, can they also exclude you based on those expressions and what you say or what your friends say on social media? And that's the new frontier. But what you find is, is that the motivations to exclude, the underlying dynamics, that use or abuse of power and 
the um, use of discretion in terms of who can, is excluded and who can be deported, um, you can trace that all the way through. And that still, that still remains. That has remained unchanged. What has changed um, is technology. And that's something to kind of look for, but that's what also makes this history so crucial, uh, which is when you understand this history and we understand that this is a long history and that this has been consistently used as a tool of political repression, you are more prepared to meet some of these challenges and some of these changes um, that we see today. Thank you. We're now going to open this up. Uh, if you would use, if you have a question, the raise hand function and join the queue. And thanks to those patient people who are already there. And if you're watching on Facebook or want to send us a question anonymously, uh, you can write to uh, our weekly uh, at historians.org, uh, R-W-H-E-A-T-L-E-Y at historians.org. Uh, first up will be co-chair Christian Osterman, who will begin us uh, uh, with a question. Thanks. Thanks for that fascinating uh, conversation and uh, congratulations on, on the book, Julia. That's a real accomplishment. This is a, a scholarly forum, a historical forum. Um, and I think it's always good in this, in this day and age to uh, talk a little bit about our sources as historians. We don't just make up these um, stories and arguments. Um, so I wonder if you could just um, talk a little bit about um, the archival and other sources that you consulted clearly over the, you know, given that you go up to, to very recent uh, times, different sets of sources than those you used for your case studies uh, earlier uh, in, in the last century. So uh, talk a little bit about your um, sources, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I used an interdisciplinary approach um, as I drew uh, on my training um, in law and in history. And uh, I think that it really makes a difference. And uh, I think that not only was I able to include analysis of statutes as well as court decisions, um, briefs and legal arguments, but also to use archival research as well as information um, I obtained through a Freedom of Information app. And all of that combined enabled me to tell this story and be able to call it a legal, political, and a social history. And it was very important for me um, to include the voices of those excluded or deported as well as their representatives and those who sought to exclude or deport them. Um, this was not going to be just a series of laws and just a series of cases, um, but we were going to see also uh, the public responses as well as uh, agency from those who are facing exclusion and deportation. Now, the best example of, of use of this interdisciplinary approach was that Ernest Mandel case and uh, in chapter six. And that's where I was able to file a uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, to obtain his immigration records. And although there were a lot of redactions, I was able to piece together a little bit through internal government documents um, what the conversations um, were, as well as going into the National Archives and finding more information about John Lennon's uh, facing deportation and some of the, the documents there pertaining uh, to why uh, John Lennon faced deportation, what were the efforts behind it, as well as uh, Shirley Graham Du Bois' um, uh, exclusion. And so that archival research was central. Now the most exciting revelation uh, was when I went to the Supreme Court archives, their papers at the Library of Congress. And I went and I, I looked at um, not only the Ernest Mandel decision, uh, Blackman's opinion as well as the dissents and those dissenting um, in that opinion or Justice Thurgood Marshall, um, Justice Brennan and Justice Douglas. And I mentioned Marshall because what I discovered by going into the papers of these justices is that Marshall was initially slotted to write the majority of opinion upholding uh, Mendel's exclusion and um, changed his mind, that he was set to write that opinion and to be part of the majority. 
and then wrote to Chief Justice um, Warren Burger and said, I'm sorry, I have to change my mind. I'm not in accord with the Chinese exclusion case and the authority granted um, to Congress. And I include the text of that letter, um, which I found. And um, what you discover is that that's, that's a huge revelation in terms of backstory of what was uh, going on um, in terms of behind the scenes of that decision. The fact that Marshall had changed his mind because of the plenary power doctrine, that Chinese exclusion case establishes the plenary power doctrine and this authority and judicial deference. And so by going into um, the, the archives and also looking at some of the notes that Justice Blackman, who was then assigned the majority opinion wrote, and his concern about entry to the United States by particular um, figures and some of his uh, concerns that led to his uh, opinion and uh, also to his formulation of that facially legitimate and bona fide reason standard. That was a revelation. And there is not, there's not one t uh, book that has provided that behind the scenes. And the only reason I'm able to provide that is because of that archival research. So I recently was talking with some law school students who were studying that decision. And I said, had I just focused on the decision um, and black men's opinion and the dissents, I would not have known about this switch or why. And I would have not known um, all this information that I can now provide and you can use to um, help better understand uh, that decision, this precedent that is still very much important today. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, in the queue, we have Sarah Peskin with a hand up. Uh, if you would unmute yourself, you may pose a question. Sarah. Um, hi, um, I was going to ask whether you were going to address the Harry Bridges case and you answered it very uh, first up, and I was delighted to hear that. Yeah. I would just say greetings from the Francis Perkins Center. We're <laughs> delighted to learn about your book, and oh. we will order it for our library. That's terrific. Thank you so much. It was very important for me to include Perkins, as well as Carol Weiss King in that chapter um, and in my narrative, uh, that I think that uh, they can often be overlooked, they're very important in this story, um, but to be able to talk um, about Perkins and her role in the Harry Bridges case and also coming under fire for her decision-making um, was crucial. Thank you. Up next, why don't we have uh, Ron Schatz. Uh, if you would unmute yourself, Ron, you may pose a question. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I found the, 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 your, your remarks on Harry Bridges extremely interesting. Um, I want to ask about one of his contemporaries who was also an immigrant and was also charged, often considered uh, close to the Communist Party, if not a Communist Party member, and was in fact a member of a larger Communist Party, a, a, a union, left-wing union, than the, 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 the uh, Longshoremen's, which was the United uh, Electrical Workers Union. And I'm thinking of James uh, Matlas, uh, who was the uh, Secretary of Treasury of, of, of the UE um, and was uh, from Romania. Um, and uh, yet he, I'm asking him, did you encounter him? Was he uh, uh, attracted as a, as a communist? If not, why not? Because uh, he, 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 I studied him and didn't encounter that sort of stuff? My, that's my question. Okay, no, I'm not, I'm not familiar, but we'll certainly look that, that up. Um, and um, I think that if you read that information um, and look, what I do with, in, in that chapter and discussion of Harry Bridges is not just focus on the case, but I also, by taking this long view, I trace the line and the evolution of the law and the changes and the efforts to deport or denaturalize. Now, not everyone faced um, deportation or denaturalization, um, but many were still under threat. And what is important in this in this part of the story is that it really has to do with um, the interpretation of the law, if you fell under the law, and also the efforts um, to uh, root out subversives 
uh, either through their memberships and affiliations, but also this concern about um, communists in the labor movement. And um, th this was part of the effort to suppress the labor movement. And so uh, everyone was kind of using all the tools, again, all the tools in the toolbox, including deportation, denaturalization, uh, to, as part of that suppression effort. So thank you very much for bringing this to my attention. All right, John Martin, if you would unmute yourself, the screen's yours. Eric, thank you very much. And thanks to, to Christian. This is a wonderful book. And uh, Professor Crowd, I, 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 I just really salute you for this because this is an area that was very, very fertile during the time I was going to university in the 1950s. I'm wondering if the Trump administration is developing its own exclusion policy. And I, the reason I asked that, uh, in July, the same month that your book came out, we uh, deported three Nicaraguans who were seeking asylum from the Sandinista uh, Ortega regime without giving them an asylum hearing at, of any kind. And uh, it, it just seems like an outrage. And I wonder if you have any you know, indication of that in your book as a case study, or were you aware of this uh, executive order that seems to be excluding people? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think when we are analyzing as historians, um, uh, and uh, specifically immigration historians looking at the Trump administration, the heart of what we'll be um, discussing is immigration and immigration restrictions um, and deportations. And um, I know that uh, I am uh, closely following along with those who are immigration lawyers and, and historians, uh, what is happening to uh, asylum seekers, uh, to refugees, to those within the United States, to those seeking entry um, under the Trump administration and the policies that are um, uh, the, the main architect of some of those policies, Stephen Miller. Now, what I, I do in, in my story, the, it is, um, I, I focus, it's, it's, it's a long view, but it's a, it's a narrow view in terms of looking at ideological exclusion deportation. As I take it up through the Trump administration to explore what I mentioned before, extreme vetting, um, but also what I cover is the travel ban, also referred to as the Muslim ban, and looking at that decision. Uh, focusing on uh, the use of uh, discretion to suspend entry uh, that, uh, and the provision in the McCarran-Walter Act that uh, President Trump uh, used. And uh, you, what you get a better sense of uh, understanding that decision, I think, when you know the history and you know, and you can trace a little bit of this law through, which is, is why I, I fought very hard to include, um, to take up, uh, to include the travel ban decision, but to take it up through the Trump administration. Um, what I would say in terms of exclusion, I mentioned before exclusion, extreme vetting, the visa process and excluding at the border. Um, what I would also say is that we need to pay very much attention to uh, that selective deportation that I, described and retaliatory deportation. Right now, there are efforts to dis suppress dissent. We have a lot of protests, lots of criticism of the government and the Trump administration. And not only do we see suppressive um, efforts to the right to protest and associate um, for those within the United States, American and non and non citizen, but the, the threat of um, deporting or using uh, participation in protest or expression of dissent to deport or to target those um, who are vulnerable to deportation or are already under um, the threat of deportation is something to really watch. And so I think moving forward, where my story can contribute is to say that we need to also pay attention to ideological exclusion and deportation. Um, and that is part of the story. It, it should be a focus when we look at deportation exclusion efforts to understand this history and also to understand the motivations behind excluding and deporting, which could be the suppressed dissent, as well as should be part of immigration reform. So as we kind of move forward and we are dealing with um, either more restrictions or attempts to roll back the restrictions we've seen over the past four years and look at immigration reform, 
um, this discussion um, of discretion, oversight, and um, ideological exclusion, deportation should be part of uh, us moving forward and part of immigration reform efforts, as well as looking at new restrictions. Thank you. We have a question that came in over email uh, from Stanislav Stanskik, who asks, did you consider passport denial and limitation to the freedom uh, to travel abroad for US citizens? Absolutely, but this was, you can't cover everything. And so, and so what I realized, and this is something I also talked with my editor about, which is, this is, that's all part of the story. The same way that when we, when we talk about, my, the goal here is that when we talk about immigration and we talk about First Amendment and we talk about the suppression of dissent, ideological exclusion and deportation is part of that story. It's part of immigration history and law in this country, and it's part of First Amendment law and uh, history and civil liberties uh, history in this country. And that's, that's the purpose of this book. But also, we are, um, the, that in terms of restriction of travel, restrictions to American citizens are also part of this story too, and is, are, are very important in terms of suppression efforts and what we considered containment. Now, I, I describe um, the, uh, those in, in chapter five, it's titled The Iron Curtain of the West. And um, that's after uh, reports of those abroad who uh, referred to the United States as the iron, um, as creating an iron curtain of the West due to these ideological exclusions, but also could be applied to the restrictions of passports at that time. And so um, the restrictions of passports are very important in terms of when we think about suppression and anti-communism. And I should also note that Leonard Boudin, who I mentioned who represented um, Mandel and those American professors uh, was, uh, the one who uh, also uh, argued the case uh, in terms uh, for uh, Kent v. Dulles, which uh, was brought up before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court struck down those restrictions um, on passports to American citizens as violating the fundamental right to travel. And so when, by the time Boudin is, is getting to the Ernest Mandel case, he's bringing all this precedent that he's helped establish with him. Thank you. Uh, Michael Goodman, uh, your hand uh, is up, so please unmute uh, and pose a question. Yeah, hello. Uh, my question uh, is this. I was going to ask you about some cases that occurred as late as the Reagan administration regarding exclusion. One case that I, I, I recall reading about was an Uruguayan professor uh, who was seeking a post at the University of Maryland, and he was denied entry to the U.S. allegedly because of Communist Party membership there. And another example I recall also from the Reagan years was a woman named Nora Astorga, uh, who was nominated to be Nicaragua's ambassador to the U.N., but under pressure from the Reagan administration, I believe that uh, she was asked not to assume uh, her post at the UN. Do you know anything about those two instances? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm not familiar with those instances, but I'm not surprised. And that's what you will find in chapter seven, which is that's where I, I discuss Reagan administration's um, use of the McCarran-Walter Act to exclude. And uh, I go into the intricacies of how they're using um, these statutes, which statute uh, and provision they turn to, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to circumvent uh, the protections I mentioned before in terms of um, 1977 and the McGovern Amendment, which uh, prevents denial of waivers of inadmissibility. And so they're using another provision under the McCarran-Walter Act uh, to exclude and they're asserting that this is also um, uh, justified as uh, part of uh, American foreign policy uh, and that uh, the entry to these individuals would uh, somehow interfere with American foreign policy. And there's a lot of pushback. There's pushback um, from the courts, uh, which take up 
uh, some of these cases of exclusion, as well as pushback from Congress uh, and organizations like, as I said before, PEN America and the American Civil Liberties Union. So um, it, this is, it's great to, to learn more um, about uh, those who are excluded, but if you're interested, I would, I would tell you definitely to check out chapter seven uh, in my book for more information about what the Reagan administration was doing and the response to it. Thank you. Uh, Edie Eiches has been quite patient. Um, if you unmute yourself, you may pose a question. Yes, uh, you can hear me, I hope. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you whether uh, there's anything in the book that traces what happened to those who were deported. And in this context, my uh, great aunt and my great uncle who were involved in the strike against uh, in Pittsburgh and were part under Emma Goldman were on the ship that went back to the Soviet Union and then they were killed. Both of them were killed by St Stalin when Stalin got control. Well, well, thank you very much for um, all these personal stories and these, this connection to this to this history. Um, I had to make some some tough decisions in terms of what I wanted to include in the book uh, because I was this is such a long history and it's not it's not a very long long book um, and uh, there were limitations in terms of uh, pages and and uh, and length uh, and because I'm taking it from 1798 to the war on terror, I had to be kind of ruthless. And part of the, those decisions were not tracing necessarily what happened to those who were deported. Now I do talk about what happened to Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, um, but I found that uh, I had to be careful about um, kind of taking those stories too far because uh, I would not be able to do what I need to do. and. Uh, provide the details and um, discussion of the law within some of these constraints. I will say that that something that's very uh, interesting is, is that those who um, faced deportation were not always deported. And um, those who, who were unable uh, to be deported because the, the country um, that uh, they were originally from refused to accept them or had closed their borders. Um, so some had to remain in the United States. Others under threat of deportation uh, decided that rather risk uh, persecution in their uh, country um, of origin to be deported or to arrange to be deported to another country as um, a form of kind of asylum, to seek asylum in another country. So I do provide information in particular cases about that, about the choice to uh, kind of self-deport um, or, or elect to be deported to another country that's safer, um, or those who just never made it um, and had to remain in the United States. Uh, but I had, to, I had to call a halt to, um, to some of my discussion. Thank you. And now we have Amit Pandya, if you would unmute. Go ahead, if you would. Amit, you are now unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, John Martin's hand is back up. John, unmute and rejoin the conversation. John. What's different about these Nicaraguan uh, deportations is that they are being deported to a regime which tortures its opponents and all three of these people have been involved in, uh, you know, anti-regime activities. And as the Human Rights Watch reports and, and all sorts of people report, we are, we are deporting people and we're deporting them and they are being tortured. And it, it seems to 
Yes, and that, that is a huge concern. I mean, this is why we have asylum. There's a, there's a real um, concern about uh, not only efforts to deport, um, to prevent uh, those uh, who sh um, are seeking asylum from staying or sending them to third countries. Um, and so it, this is a huge issue. And I know that, that um, there are immigration lawyers who are working tired, tirelessly um, to challenge these restrictions by, under the Trump administration um, and to try to prevent these deportations. Now, in terms of my own work, I would direct you to chapter um, three and chapter four when I talk about uh, the deportations delirium uh, in the wake of the Palmer raids and the efforts to deport. And uh, Lewis Post, who is the Assistant, Assistant Secretary of Labor, who was trying to prevent deportations. Um, and as well as chapter four, um, where I talk about in the 1930s, this is a real concern. You have many people who are facing deportation um, under uh, federal laws um, that are afraid to be deported back to um, fascist uh, countries and uh, face persecution. And so there is a uh, major publicity and efforts to prevent their deportation. And there are those who are saying, why are you deporting me to only die um, once I arrive and to be persecuted. So this is a very big issue, but especially in, in, in terms of my narrative in the 1930s, um, when uh, there's a real concern about the countries they're being deported to, and will they be persecuted because of their identities and their beliefs and their expressions of dissent. Uh, so there's, there's, this is a very important history. And the more we learn about immigration history, the more we are prepared to tackle the challenges of today. Thank you. Amit's hand is back up. So again, if you would unmute yourself, you can pose the question. Go ahead, please. I think we have a technical problem, I'm assuming, at Amit's end, because we can't hear. Do you think that maybe he can, he can type it? If it comes in, we can pose it. Um, well, let me let me perhaps uh, try to 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 wrap up with a question that looks back and looks forward. Um, you make it clear in the book and in the talk uh, that who is in office matters. Uh, some administrations use ideological exclusion and deportation more forcefully than others. Uh, it mattered that Francis Perkins was labor secretary under Roosevelt in the 30s. Um, and you just mentioned Lewis Post. It mattered that he was uh, assistant labor secretary um, during the Red Scare. Both officials took uh, stands against uh, anti-radical hardliners. We are coming up on a presidential election, apparently. Uh, early voting has begun in a number of states. So I want to talk about where you see ideological exclusion and deportation going. Presumably a Trump victory would see more of the same, a heavy hand, a heavy reliance on this. Uh, but what about a Biden victory? Would a Democratic win this time around result in reforms that the challengers that you've highlighted uh, uh, in this book uh, have been seeking? Uh, and if not, why not? Okay. Um, that's, that is a great question. And that is something that I focus on in the book, which is we've created a system where not only have we insulated immigration um, from uh, some of the due process protections that we enjoy uh, under our criminal system, immigration is considered a civil uh, matter and not a criminal matter. And so we don't have the same kind of due process protections um, that uh, we would uh, have uh, under uh, the Fifth Amendment uh, in, a, in a criminal proceeding. And we also don't have, again, that substantive uh, judicial review because of the insulation of the by the plenary power doctrine. And that's something that has persisted. Um, we are not subjecting um, these uh, ideological deportation cases to strict scrutiny um, or the same level of, uh, of speech protective First Amendment standards. Um, and so 
that is something that's that's important and that the, the courts have kind of upheld so far and have, have upheld the plenary power doctrine and the deference have, have has deferred to um, the discretion of executive um, of the executive branch and public officials, including the president and um, Congress. So what you have is that what I emphasize is that the, how who is in power, who is that um, official, who are consular officials, who are um, who the president is, who um, the head of the Justice Department is. Um, all of this really matters because of this judicial deference to those to the, the determinations by those officials and the guidance they receive to make those determinations. Who gets a waiver? Who doesn't? Who's admitted? Who isn't? Who is at the border? Who's examining your visa and has the power to deny you entry? Um, who is that individual? Um, who? What? It, where is the oversight? And so, what I've concluded is that um, not only does it matter. Um, and I show that that it matters who is in power and who's making those decisions, but also where you can get recourse. And what we found is that not necessarily through the courts, that um, especially after the travel ban decision, that it's really up to Congress to make changes to the system. Um, if the courts are not willing to relook their adherence to the plenary power doctrine, and will continue um, this uh, deference to the executive and legislative branches, um, then we really have to have changes um, made by Congress to those statutes and protections and more oversight. And that's really gonna come from immigration reform. I think where we see the future is, is, is that, that we're, we're not gonna be looking to, to the courts, but to Congress. And I would draw your attention to something I include in the book called the No Ban Act which is addressing the travel ban, repealing the travel ban, but also provides much more oversight and requirements to justify uh, exclusion and suspension of entry and raises the standard of scrutiny um, to those decisions. That's a pathway forward. But I should also mention too, though, in, the, in discussions, this is gonna take a lot of work. And those who are saying, well, if the Biden administration, we can roll back everything, it's gonna take a lot to roll back um, what we've seen in this administration, as well as what we've seen in previous administrations. This um, administration has done quite a bit to restrict, but is also building on the past. And so we're, we have a lot of work to do, but I think it's gonna have to come through Congress. Thank you. And with that, uh, I will have to draw this to a close. Let me just say, uh, Julia, that I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation uh, and the book, uh, and I will turn this over to Christian for final words. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let me remind all of uh, our viewers that we will meet again next week, this coming week at our regular time on Monday, October 19th at 4 p.m. I think we have a really terrific panel lined up uh, featuring Simon Miles, Duke Simon Miles, uh, science professor Mary Sarotti, and State Department historian Elizabeth Charles, talking about Simon's new book, Engaging the Evil Empire. Thanks, Julia, again, for Thank a terrific uh, conversation. Congratulations on the book. Thanks to all of you out there for your questions. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.